What does an 18-year veteran of the tech industry and a 20-year veteran of the military have in common? More than you might think. Welcome everyone to the, the Second, Second Act, Act Podcast. Podcast, leveling up your life's journey. You Welcome back to the Second Act Podcast with Michael and John. How are you doing today, John? Hey, Michael. I'm good. Um, my morning routine is um, leaving me a little struggling. Normally, I'll tell you what, I usually work out in the mornings and get those endorphins going, but today, got the workout in, but it's just, man, I'm dragging for some reason. Maybe it's Monday. Maybe it's a long weekend. I don't know, but uh, I'm fighting through it. So we're gonna we're gonna adapt and overcome, as they say. How about <laughs> I you? I like that that you you didn't blame the family, kids, or any of the the normal uh, energy drags. Nope. Um, nope. Which I can I can certainly relate to as well. I got a run in. I got some cardio in this morning, so that helped. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty excited. We got some some new members signing up for our member community. We've got. An amazing guest that's going to come on today. I'm super excited about um, this person coming on and and yeah. sharing his story that we'll get to in just a second here. Well, hey, why don't you yeah. why don't you tell everybody real quick while we get while we're on the topic about the membership that we're offering? Yeah. So um, John and I put our our heart and soul into this hobby slash business that we have going on here and. We get to meet some really incredible people and build connection through the process of learning their life journey, uh, the ups and downs of all of that to share with uh, the world, really. Anybody who yeah. has an interest in um, you know, ordinary people really doing extraordinary things with their lives. They've had some event in their life where uh, it's caused them to have a paradigm shift in how they think about the world, how they think about they go about their day, what success means all of that good stuff. Um, and to you know, keep what we're doing um, going and expanding in the ways that we hope will have lasting effects uh, here and around the world. We do have listeners around the world. We created yeah. a little member community for folks who want to spend you know, less than a cost of a latte per month to join that community, get some exclusive content, um, some really funny stories. We just released a, a great story about uh, our very own John Ballinger. And uh, yeah, we have some members starting to sign up and becoming aware and, and super excited about all that. But um, yeah, so that's that's the next iteration of our yeah. journey here, John. Uh, you know, it's exciting to you know hear you talking about that because a year ago when we conceptualized coming together and starting a podcast and we didn't even imagine, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 episodes into it. We didn't even imagine uh, a community that it now exists. And it's all just coming along day after day. And it's it's so much fun to see how putting one foot forward, one in front of the other, creates yep. this momentum that now is is even bigger than we even dreamed about. So, um yeah, it's it's super exciting. Yeah, and our our guests, um, it's such an a, an amazing diversity of guests that we yeah. have come on the show, uh, and today is not going to disappoint. We certainly have a cohort of folks who uh, are military veterans who come from your world, John. We have some tech folks uh, who come yeah. from the world that uh, I know very well, and and everything in between um, at all stages in life. So, with that said, yeah. I want to jump in and introduce our guest today. In, in this week's episode, we are joined by Harley Blakeman, founder and CEO of Honest Jobs, the nation's leading job marketplace for people affected by the criminal justice system. Harley's life story is one filled with tragedy and triumph, where he experienced firsthand the challenges of being a justice-impacted individual. Harley's childhood started out in a small town in Florida, and as an early teenager, his family life became unraveled through a series of unfortunate events causing Harley to make some missteps that would land him in prison and alter his future. Wow. Using his time as an incarcerated individual to reflect and decide on how he was going to live his life going forward, Harley changed directions and focused on enriching his education and his spirituality. Harley went on to graduate from the Ohio State University with honors, 
but his past continued to haunt him as he sought gainful employment, and recognizing an opportunity through his own personal experience, he landed, he launched rather, Honest Jobs, a company helping millions of people with criminal records find employment and critical support services faster. So welcome to the show, Harley. Man. Yeah, thank you for having me, Michael and John. It's it's great to meet both of you and, and to have this discussion with you. Yeah. Happy to be here. That is a crazy intro. I can't wait <clears throat> to honestly dig into this um this episode and hear your story. Man, Harley, um, you know, we get a lot of like Michael said before, we get a lot of interesting backgrounds, but I think yours um truly kind of catches my attention right off the bat. So if we can Man, let's go back to the beginning. Um, you grew up in a small town in Florida. Um, what was life like there? And, and, you know, include some of the family events or or things, people that, that started to influence your life there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, I'll, I'll paint the full picture. Uh, and I think a lot of people come from situations like me, circumstances like yeah. me. There's a large amount of Americans that, their skin may be a different color. Their neighborhood may have been structured different. Their the size of the city or town they're in may be different. But like the circumstances I went through are not really unique. We just don't hear enough of the stories. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I was born in Dallas, Texas. Moved to Arkansas pretty young, like three yeah. years old. I moved to Arkansas with my mom and dad. Um, and then maybe around seven, I moved to Florida. Okay. So I, I grew up in a tiny little town, a one, one red light town called Keystone Heights, Florida. It's uh, maybe 30 minutes from Gainesville. Uh, It's probably the closest city that people know, University of Florida. Um, So so that's one point is, you know, I moved several times as a kid. And and the reason we moved a lot was just my mom and dad were really kind of, I say they're like the black sheep of their families because neither one of them stayed in contact with their family, really. Like it was just them and their kids, Um, which was fine. You know, growing up, I didn't really think anything of it, but as an adult now, I realize like the value of having a strong network of friends and family. So, uh, I get to Florida around seven or eight years old and, you know, had, had what I believe is a fairly normal life. Uh, uh, my mom and dad, my older brother, uh, we lived in this small town called Keystone Heights and, uh, I did live in like a single white trailer. So I basically grew up in a trailer park, which again, at the time as, as a child, it didn't matter. I didn't think anything about it, you know, um, went to school at a, uh, from what my parents always told me, it was a good school, um, but it was just a, a very small town. So we had like an elementary school, like K through fifth grade, and then sixth grade through 12th grade was all one school. So that's also fairly uncommon. Uh, I think it's more common to these really small towns where they can't afford to have a middle school. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up there uh, skateboarding. I just, that was kind of my thing is at a young age, I stopped playing sports and really gravitated, gravitated towards skateboarding. And um, that's all I would do, really. I'd go to school. And then after that, I would skate around town all day until the sun went down with my friends. And, you know, my, my uh, mom and dad were really supportive and kind of like the cool parents, <laughs> if you will. Like uh, everyone wanted to hang out at our house, uh, uh, which... You know, later in life, I realized they were a little too cool, I think. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, my, my, my mom and dad would every other weekend or so take us to Jacksonville to go to a skate park or Gainesville or Orlando. We'd go to a skate park, go to the beach, go surfing and stuff. And, and my friends really enjoyed that. So all in all, it was a, a good childhood. Like I said, now I realize we were very, very poor. Um, uh, but at the time, I didn't know. You know, it didn't really make a difference to me. And it wasn't until... Um, maybe uh, 12, 13 years old, about 13 years old, uh, my parents started fighting a lot. So a lot of arguing. Uh, and again, you know, you don't really understand this stuff in the moment, but uh, my mom lost like 100 pounds. She lost like 80 or 100 pounds uh, just by like dieting. And uh, and uh, after like a 19, 20 year marriage, she just one day left. And she told mm. me and my brother, like me and your dad are separating. And uh, I can't take it anymore. You know, she like blamed my dad for a bunch of stuff, which, um, try not to, to read into this stuff too much. But the truth is, is my mom had my older brother when she was 15 years old. Like she, had, she was a parent uh, from a very yeah. young age. And I think she never really had a chance to be, uh, a kid herself really. Like 
she was forced yeah. into parenting at such a young age. So she was dealing with her own depression, trauma, uh, mental health issues. And after she left, she like immediately became like a very severe drug addict and alcoholic. And she was like living on couches at different people's houses. So it was no environment for me. So really like um, my mom and I kind of separated essentially. I didn't know where she was most of the time. I had, I'd go weeks or months without talking to her. So, so that was really hard. I mean, I still uh, struggle a little bit and talk to my therapist about like, I consciously know that none of this was my fault, but like subconsciously yeah. as a kid, you're still like, why would my mom leave when I was 13? Like, what yeah. did I do to cause her to leave? So that was really hard on me. And then, um, so it was me and my older brother living with my dad. It was hard on my older brother too, because my older brother's dad abandoned him when he was like three. So now wow. my older brother grew up without his dad. Yeah. And then when he turned 18, his mom left and he has some, some like kind of trauma from that as well, even though, you know, he was 18. But yeah, it was uh, about a year, year and a half after my mom left, uh, I was in like math class principal pulls me out of the classroom and says, uh, my, my, my brother has come to the school to get me. And, uh, my brother like takes, walks me out of the, out of the building. And it was like, our, our dad got in a motorcycle accident. Uh, he used to drive a Harley to work like once or twice a week on a, on sunny days or whatever. And he, my brother said, it's really, really bad. We got to go to the hospital. So my, my, uh, older brother and I drive to the hospital and when we get there the first thing they do is they pull us into a little room and they say your dad's not going to make it we need you to if you want to say goodbye to him he's through this door you can go in and say goodbye to him Jeez, how, how uh, old are you Harley at this time at that time I was wow. 15 15 okay 15 years old so uh this is like I said about a year and a half after my mom left <clears throat> I, I I get pulled into this room and and they were like, you don't have to, but if you want to, you can go in and say goodbye. And I'm like, of course I'm going to go. And like, in my mind, I, I don't even think I understood really the m gravity of yeah. the situation. But uh, when I went in, my my dad was, I mean, really extremely bad shape, like wrapped up. Like most of his body was covered and wrapped up. And uh, it was just devastating. I mean, that day was just like the worst day you could ever yeah. imagine. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I uh, said goodbye and... Basically, that was the first day of homelessness for me because I, over the next week or two, I went through the motions that I like had to go through from external people saying, okay, well, this is how this is going to work and these are all the things. But, you know, two weeks later, I was just sleeping on couches and didn't really have a home and had kind of slipped through the cracks. And I'm happy to dive into how that all happened. Um, Man. But yeah, so these are like some of the uh, the challenges that kind of initially got me ultimately to prison. But uh, yeah. I, at that point, I was still very much like an innocent kid that, you know, had done nothing wrong, just really dealt a really bad hand in a short period of time. Yeah, I'm just thinking back to when I was 15 years old, Harley, and I just can't imagine uh, a circumstance like that. Um, it's, uh, you know, our a lot of the things we do in life are, are influenced by our experiences in life. Yeah. Um, and I know, you know, all of those events uh, led you to make some decisions that in hindsight weren't the best ones, but you, you were able to persevere. So as things start to unravel, you, you find yourself making a series of choices that, that get you into, into prison as, a, as an incarcerated individual. So share your perspective at that time and how it led you to change direction with your life. Yeah, I think I um, uh, so pretty ho like helpless and hopeless because I didn't really have um, like a relative to go to to like grieve with and to kind of support me and talk me through how everything's going to be okay. It, re it really was um, challenging for me because my mom had already kind of broke my trust and, and lost my trust um, and she was battling with her own challenges. So she actually like came to the, she came to the funeral, right? And I had some distant relatives that came in for the funeral, which was like my mom's, my dad's mom and his sisters. I had met them like two or three times in my life, <clears throat> but we weren't close at all. They lived in Columbus, Ohio. I barely knew them, but they came and they were like, look, you can, you can come back to Ohio with us. And unfortunately, um, 
you know, I'm a kid. So maybe at the time I was like, oh, I don't want to leave my friends. I don't really know. But I was 15 years old. I, I can't remember the exact conversation. But I remember my mom saying, he can stay here with me. Like, I'll take care of him. I'll make sure everything's okay. And, um, you know, I think I wanted that to be true. You know, I yeah. wanted to think that, like, I could be with my mom. But yeah. it wasn't a week or two later, um, my my mom had kind of my the family from Ohio had left and I was going to be staying with my mom and I realized that like I can't stay with my mom my mom was extremely unstable and I was you know I stayed the night with her once or twice and the house was just disgusting it wasn't even her home and there was drugs everywhere and uh, I just had to get out and I think at that time I you know I grew up out of the house a lot already like I said I used to skate until dark every single night I had some friends that I was really close with so I made the decision to just start staying with some friends and um, you know, I, 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 it's hard for me to wrap my head around, but at 15 years old, I remember being at my dad's funeral and one of my older brother's friends offered me a Xanax. And I, I don't think it was, I, I don't think that was the first time I ever took drugs, but it was close to, if it wasn't the first time it was close to it. And I just remember it was just downhill from there. Like I was struggling, uh, to, uh, deal with this on my own like I just think I was burying myself with pain uh you know I was feeling the pain so much that I was just burying it with drugs so I started with Xanax and living on people's couches um uh, was difficult I didn't have a car I didn't have money I was just a kid and well although all of my friends and their parents had really good intentions uh give me a place to stay I would start to feel unwelcome you know six months after I'm living with one friend I'm feeling very unwelcome like I don't have money I I can tell that this is a burden uh but they don't want to ask me to leave no one's going to ask a 15 16 year old kid to, to go outside um but I ultimately felt the need to like move from one house to another and then to another and before you knew it as I was getting older I started to feel really guilty about it like I'm, I can just be a man. Like, I can just be a grown man. Why, why am I trying to, to live on people's houses and do all this? So with that mentality of, like, I'm just going to take care of myself. I have to. With that mentality came, like, well, I just do what I have to do then. And uh, it went from using drugs, which I do believe is, like, purely covering up pain, trying to deal with the, the experiences I had gone through, uh, to now I'm starting to sell drugs, you know, just like weed or or. or prescription pills uh but i in that mindset i stopped going to school because i was like i don't always have a ride to school i don't have clean laundry most of the time and uh i remember i don't know seventh grade eighth grade maybe my principal pulled me aside i was already missing a bunch of classes showing up late not coming in some days pulled me aside and said, Early, I know you've been selling selling weed at school and you either need to stop coming to school or I'm going to have you arrested. And I remember that was the last day I went to school. I think I was 16 years yeah. old. I just wow. said, well, I guess I'm not going to come anymore. Um, so uh, I probably didn't tell the story in the perfect like rhythm or cadence, but like the depression from losing my father and my mother not being there really drove me into drugs. And then yeah, if you buy drugs enough illegally on the street, you find yourself hanging out with criminals. I mean, you have to, if you're yep. buying drugs, you're usually associating yep. with someone who is a criminal. And unfortunately, something that comes with that is, you know, they're one day they're selling you weed. The next day you're exposed to pills. The next time you're exposed to Coke. The next thing you know, they're saying, why don't you sell drugs? Yeah. And, and um, you know, I take full responsibility. I, I was conscious, you know, I was a, an eager entrepreneur who hadn't learned about, entrepreneurship yet (laughs) and this was my first endeavor into it was like how can i be self-sustaining how can i take care of myself and and uh you know i I joke about it but at 17 years old i had unlicensed pharmaceutical rep in keystone heights florida uh i was buying and, and selling prescription pills and the short of it is is that allowed me to not live on people's couches anymore and i was able to get my own car in my own place and you know, before I go any further, you know, we can stop. But uh, there's a lot of people in this country who are falling through the cracks if they're a kid or if they're an adult where they feel like they don't have options, where it, yeah. if it's the geography they live in, there's no jobs, or if they just grew up with parents that were drug addicts or whatever it may be, but our society's not really set up uh, to have the safeguards in place to make sure that kids are 
set all set up on equal footing when they turn 18 or when they have uh, go into adulthood. And, you know, Harley, without having all this context that you just shared that led up yeah. to this point, it's really easy for a person to just superficially make a judgment about, a, you know, a bad decision someone has made and ha- that has put them in jail. And uh, there's a lot of things typically that lead up to that. And a- as you just said, it was out of, you know, somewhat out of necessity uh, that you were making some of the decisions that you made. But once you were in prison, you you started to, I think, rethink life and, you know, gained another perspective while in there. Do, I don't know if you want to sort of shift into how that started to go or, John, if you wanted to jump in. Yeah, Harley, I want to just, you know, commend you so far on the story that you've shared on just the true grit that you have as an individual. I mean, I, I, my mother walked out on me when I was, you know, in elementary school, my, my, me and my father, I was an only child, but she walked out and left us alone. And that was in itself, um, a a really tough situation, but I don't think people realize the gravity that a 15 year old could have on themselves with yeah. no direction. I mean, you're you're literally like a boat sitting in a in a ocean, waves crashing, no sail, no rudder, yeah. and you're just trying to navigate. You may see, you know, the lighthouse off in the distance, but you have no way of getting there. And and just as you're experiencing and and you're communicating this experience with us, I just feel this this sense of loss uh, for you, and it's no wonder that all these external forces that are sta- are are now starting to uh, you know affect you are having such a big impact and people might you know to michael's point they say well you know obviously this is what's going to happen but if they take a second and put themselves in your shoes or in the shoes of a 15 year old child without direction without mentorship without you know coaches without family to really guide and steer them you're yeah. going yep. to be directionless. And so, you know, first of all, you know, to s- be sitting here and having a conversation with you after so many years and, and you, you obviously navigated your way out of it, man, congratulations on that. But, um, I just want to say your story so far has been completely compelling for, for me and, and the people that I'm around to just make sure that there's influence in in people's lives and just taking that time to really reach out and, and lend a helping hand where you can. So, man, I I just want to say that before we continue. Yeah. And I think it's, it's so easy for people to just like, uh, Michael was saying is, you know, you, the truth is, is you always have another option. You don't have to commit a crime. But we don't realize how many options we have in our lives. Sure. Right. Until you're limited to so few, right? It's like we all have options, and I probably had other options, but did I have many options and did I have any good options? Probably not. I probably had no good options and very few options at that. And, you know, one of the things I, people always ask me, like, why, what changed? Like, what, you know, we'll talk about it more later, but I didn't feel like it mattered. I was like, what, what's the, like, what am I, who am I trying to oppress? Who am I trying to create this great life for? There's literally no purpose in my life at all. Like nothing uh, matters. Interesting. You know? <laughs> uh, that's kind of how I felt at the time. It wasn't like, I've never been a, a, a bad person. I've never been a violent person. Never wanted to hurt anybody, but I was always like, I don't care about me. What does even yeah. matter? You know? So that's a, that's a really, uh, tough place to be like you were saying especially at such a young age so you know uh, fast forward let's just say a couple months you know 16 now i am selling drugs and i've officially dropped out of high school so now i'm a high school dropout and what do you do with your days when you live in a tiny town uh there's nothing going on there's virtually no jobs um i started hanging out with other people who were sitting around doing nothing during the day so uh you know I, i i share this story that, you know, I, I knew several drug dealers who played Xbox all day and just hung out at home and, you know, 
people would come by their house six, 10 times a day to buy something. And that was their job. So I'd hang out there and a, surprisingly a couple of them in their thirties and forties would be like, just give me free meals and give me a place to hang out and crash. And, um, eventually, you know, more than one of them offered to say, well, here, I can just give you free, like not give for free, but like front you, they call it fronting you something to like give you a half pound of weed and say, sell it and pay me back, make yourself some money. And, and uh, ultimately by the time I was 17, that was a registered nurse that I knew who was buying illegally, you know, hundreds of Oxycontin, thousands of Oxycontin for pennies on the dollar. Wow. And she would just give me 10, 20, 30, 50 of them and say, sell them for this much and give me half of what you make. And um, wow. it was unfortunately a, a, a trap that I, you know, fell into. I think at the time I saw her as almost like a mother figure yeah. because she was a friend to me and she was offering food and shelter and help, you know, now I know, okay, she wasn't really helping me, but at the time I thought she was helping me by offering to help me make some money. And um, I did that for, for quite a while, not making money in any real way, but making enough money to like feed myself and have gas money if I needed a ride somewhere and 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 things like that. Um, but uh, just to give context for, for like my mom, throughout this period of 15, 16, 17, my mom was still in the same town. Um, so there were times where I had nowhere to stay. And, and I remember vividly one time going to where she was and knocking on the door. It was like 1130 at night. I had to walk like two miles down some dirt country road to get to the house she was at and knocking on the door and asking if I could just sleep on, uh, on the couch. And she told me, no, she was like, you can't come in. You can't come in. And I just remember Jeez. like how devastating that has been. Like, that's like one of the few things I remember deeply from my childhood is like, yeah. um, it wasn't just that I chose to go somewhere else. It was like, there was points where I literally had nowhere to go. So these things kind of chipped away at my soul a little bit to where I was like, I really don't care at all anymore. Yeah. And like, it's just me, like, it's just me against the world. Like I'm out here trying to survive. And, uh, this woman who would front me the prescription pills, I was so small time because it was such a small town. Like I could never make a lot of money, but a friend of mine that I grew up skateboarding with had moved to Savannah, Georgia, and he invited me. He was like, hey, you should come up and hang out. Uh, like, I've got a real nice apartment here. You could stay with me for a week or two if you wanted. And I thought, I should do this. I'll kind of get a escape for a little bit and go hang out with some friends. So I did that. And while I was there, I showed him, hey, look, like, I have these pills. Like, I can get I can get these pills. And he's like, oh, I don't do those. I don't, I don't do stuff like that. But I do know that they sell for a lot of money here. And he kind of explained to me that, you know, I was selling them for like $15 a pill, but in Savannah, Georgia, they were worth $25 a pill. Oof. And he was like, I know a bunch of people here that will buy those. And a short conversation led to him saying, hey, I know a guy that would probably buy all of this from you. Oof. And he called the guy and I sold him like, it was like 10 or 15 of them. But the guy, but the guy was, was like, like hey, hey, can you bring me back more? Like if I wanted like 50 or 100 of them, can you do it? And I was like, yeah. So I went home with the plan of getting more and coming back. And uh, the following week, that's what I did is I got a hundred of them and I drove them back up and, you know, I was getting them for like $8 a piece and selling them for $25 and, and, you know, a hundred of them, I quick math, I made a couple hundred bucks, uh, very quickly, maybe a, th a couple thousand and it just turned into a routine. I was like, I have this one guy that I sell these pills to once a week and I, before I knew it, I was bringing up three, four, five hundred of them at a wow. time. And my life changed very quickly. Like, I wasn't happier or healthier. I was still dealing with all the depression. But now I had the money to buy myself a car, to get an apartment, and to completely drown myself in drugs. <laughs> because, like I said, the pain didn't go away. The addiction didn't go away. I yeah. just had money now. And I, uh, I didn't have the guilt of having to stay on someone else's couch. Um so that's really where like the full evolution of me like becoming a drug dealer was I just had an opportunity to follow my lap to make a lot of money really easily. And I was doing that. And I did that probably for about six, seven months before I turned 18. And uh, um, I was in, I was in an extremely dark place. Like, I don't want to make it sound like it was a good life. Yeah. It wasn't. I yeah. just had a money and no bills. So I was I was thinking I like I'm on top of the world or something. But um it was shortly after my 18th birthday in Savannah, Georgia. 
I'm sitting at a red light at like 9 a.m. I just driven up super early to take this person a bunch of pills. And uh, I got set up by the Chatham County Narcotics team. So I'm just sitting at a red light, like seven cop cars surround my car out of nowhere. They all come out of nowhere. And I, obviously I know, I'm like, okay, this is definitely for me. And I, they run up to the, to my window with their gun drawn, pointing their gun at me, telling me to put my hands out the window. And I do, and they slam me on the ground and put their knee on the back of my neck. And my mugshot, I even have scratches all on my forehead from the concrete. And uh, uh. The, the mugshot is, you gotta, you gotta look it up and share the show notes or something. I mean, I look like I'm like nine years old, 10 years old maybe, but I'm, I'm actually 18. But they put me in the back of this cop car and they come over to the cop car and they say, do we have permission to search the vehicle? And I don't know, I do, for, for some reason the car was in my mom's name. I, I think it's because when my dad passed away, he left, um, uh, there was a little bit of life insurance money and I was able to use the money to buy the car, but it had to be in my mom's name because I wasn't old enough. So anyways, I tell the cops, I can't let you search it because it's not my car. My my name isn't on the car. I can't let you search it. And they're like, oh, okay. So they shut the door and then they just go like pop the trunk and start digging through my car. Like they didn't, they didn't care. It, it, it didn't work. <laughs> so anyways, they pull out this backpack and they pull out like a really, like a half pound of marijuana. And then they pull out a Ziploc of Oxycontin and like a Ziploc bag of Xanax. And what's crazy is I, I don't, I still don't really know exactly what was going through my mind, but I remember seeing them take everything out and just this wave of relief came over me. It's so <laughs> weird. Because I had lived with this anxiety of being caught or whatever, but when I got caught, it's like the reverse effect. Like I just had this wave of like relief come over me, and I I just laid down in the back of the cop car, and I just went right to sleep. I don't know why. I just uh, it's like I could finally rest, like knowing that it was like over or something, which is stupid because I that part was over, and now I had this new yeah. thing that was about to start that I was going to have to deal with. But yeah, I mean that that's the evolution of it and my short time as a as a drug dealer for, for like a year, year and a half there. Hi everybody, I'm Katie Segal. And I'm Kurt Sutter. And welcome to our new podcast called Pi, People, Influences, and Experiences. Yes, it's sort of the uh, get to know you at a deeper level, the who, what, when, where, and why you are rather than what it is you do. Absolutely. We're not going to talk too much about what people do. We just want to know about their families, where they come from, you know, what shapes their parenting if they have kids, what shapes their marriages if they're married. We just want to be really nosy. We want to get in there. A deep dive into nature and nurture. And we started it because there are a lot of people that we don't know that we are curious about. Right. And I have no friends, so for me, it's... You know, try like, to get him out of the house. Listen to it on whatever you listen to <laughs> podcasts on. Yeah, podcast your, 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 your podcasting apparatus. Watch it on the YouTube. He's aging himself. I'm not a psychologist in any way, Harley. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it sounds like you were metaphorically or literally on the run, right? And... Uh, from from some things in your life and that event where the cops surround you and and you know that maybe something is coming to an end you're you're not having to run anymore yep. from the problems maybe that's what led to the relief for you uh, at, at least in some way i mean like you just said you're going to have a whole another set of circumstances to start dealing with now that that point in time had happened but um, at least from what you've shared, I can sort of understand how you got to that feeling of relief, um, based on your story. Yeah. Um, and, and as an entrepreneur, it's, it's, it's almost like a skill I learned as a kid, as a homeless kid that has paid me well is like when the shit hits the fan, I actually take a breath and start to organize and, and think through how I'm going to solve this rather than kind of... Yeah throwing in the towel and running I, i'm like okay this is this is where i got to clear my mind and calm down and really figure figure things out um so yeah i know i i completely agree i think that's right is i knew that um that chapter was was over for me uh yeah. harley while you were talking I, I did pull up your your mug shot here 
and man, you look like a kid. You're right. You look like uh, you could be my son and my son's 11. I'm like, holy cow. I can't imagine that, that feeling of being surrounded by police officers. But then as you described it, being removed from a situation that you probably didn't want to be in anyway, I've got to wonder when you did lay down in the back of that cop car and start going through your, the, you know, the motions to, to end up in prison. Was it a feeling of this is a new start for me, or I'm going to do something different with my life once it's all passed? Or, or are you just kind of just caught up in the moment thinking, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Um, let's, let's see how it plays out. Yeah, I don't think it was that clear for me at the time. I think I knew that this was the end of a chapter and in that I didn't know what tomorrow was going to bring. And uh, it could have even just been like blocking out the reality is like instead of trying to comprehend all this, like it's sure. too scary or too hard to comprehend. I'm just going to like check out like may maybe it was that as well, uh, because I can tell you like it certainly wasn't the next day where I'm like, all right, now I'm going to work towards my my dream job and my this great life it was like the next day was you know waking up in chatham county jail which is like one of the scariest places i've ever been in my life far it was scarier than prison it was scarier <laughs> like the chatham county jail was insane and luckily you know they give people bail and luckily i had enough friends i had a girl that i was dating in savannah i'd only been dating her a couple weeks but i called her and she was like yeah i'm gonna come get you out and she paid my bail um and uh, when I got out, she was like, I need $500 because I took that from my mom's bank account. I got I to gotta put that money back before my mom finds out I took it. Um, and I was like, okay, well, yeah, let's go to my apartment. And I, I'll figure out how to get all my stuff back. Well, we went to my apartment. There was a sticker on the door saying I've been evicted, that I can't live there anymore because after they arrested me, they went and searched my apartment and dug, dug all around all my stuff. My gosh. So I'm call I'm calling the Chatham County Jail to figure out where my car is. Well, they said your car has been seized and you can't have it back into your court date, and all of your money has also been seized. So I have no all I have is a phone. I have no car, no money, no no place to sleep, and I'm back at zero zero dollars, nowhere to sleep, nothing to do. In this, my girlfriend at the time, like kind of a girlfriend, starts losing it. She's like, I need that money, like I need it, and she's like telling me like go back to Florida, and get some drugs fronted to you so that you can make the money. I need this money back. And I was like, look, I'm not doing that. Like I'll figure out how to get you your money back as soon as I can, but I'm not doing that. I am not, I'm not selling drugs anymore. So anyways, she wasn't super excited to like <laughs> hang out with me or help me at that point. She was very mad at me. And uh, so <laughs> I end up staying with a, a friend that I knew in Savannah um, for a couple days, but ultimately I realized like, okay, it's going to be months before my court date. I have no car, no job, no money, no place to live. And I ended up talking to a friend in Florida that came and got me. And I went back to Keystone Heights and I was living on couches again in Florida illegally because I'm not even allowed to leave the state of Georgia because I'm on bail in Georgia, but I have nowhere else to go. So basically I was back in Florida, homeless, living on couches and knowing that I'm going to go to prison. I'm still a drug addict, but I don't sell drugs anymore which is worse because I can't even take care of my own addiction and I can't feed myself barely. But I had a couple of good friends that their parents were kind enough to like feed me and let me stay there. And I did like odd jobs. I used to pressure wash with a friend while I was out on bail and we did a couple things to make money, but I wasn't committing crime. I was committed to not doing that. Um, and there's a second mugshot somewhere on the internet that shows me, um, where I look older, but I have no fat on my face. You can see all like, I just look really unhealthy. And that's because, oh. you know, I knew I was going to prison. I had no money, no job, no, and I was just abusing drugs pretty heavily. And uh, while I was out on bail in Florida, two people accused me of stealing something that I didn't even steal. I don't want to, we can't spend a ton of time talking about it because, you yeah. know, we don't have so much time, but I was accused of grand theft. These two women said it was me, but I used to sell both of them drugs. So I know that they are drug addicts. Uh, and they basically said, oh, Harley did this, and they both wrote witness statements saying it was me, and one day the police just knocked on my friend's door and said, we have a warrant for Harley's arrest uh, for grand theft, and I was like, I don't know what this is. Can you tell me what's going on? And they were like, nope. 
just come with us. And uh, ultimately, I found out that these two people said I stole this. And I sat in jail in Florida for three and a half months trying to fight this case with the public defender. And ultimately, the the courts in Florida came to me and said, we'll just give you time served. You can leave today. No probation, no parole, nothing. You don't even have to say you did it. You just have to plead no contest. Hmm. You can get out right now. All you got to do is sign here. And my public defender was like, this might be your best option because given that you have no family to vouch for, you already have a pending felony. If you go to trial, there is a chance that they convict you of this, even if you are innocent. Uh, and there is a chance that you sit here for 15 months fighting this in trial when you could just leave today. If you're already going to get convicted in Florida, uh, in Georgia, it might make sense to take this. So I ended up signing it. And I got convicted of a felony that day. And the next day, they said, you're going to get out tonight. You're going to get out tonight because you took the deal. Well, they didn't let me out that night because the state of Georgia put a hold on me. Because when I got convicted, Georgia found out I was in jail and Georgia told him until we come get him. So I ended up that night, I'm like, hey, I'm supposed to get out. Why aren't you letting me out? And they're like, oh, sorry, Georgia put a hold on you. They're going to come get you tomorrow. So the next day, I had to ride a van from Florida to Georgia. And then I sat in jail in Chatham County, Georgia for another about a month before they sped up my court date. And I ended up going to court in Georgia. And uh, I, I took a, a plea bargain under in Georgia, what they call the First Offenders Act, which says if it's your first time being convicted of a crime in their state, um, you can sign a deal, but that you're allowed to ask the judge to reduce your sentence. So I had to agree to the deal first for the opportunity to ask for a light sentence. So I agreed to three years in prison. Jeez. You know, I'm 18 years old. Uh, I agreed to three years in prison because I had already, I didn't have a lawyer or anything. Yeah. And then when I go in front of the judge, my public defender says, we're asking for the First Offenders Act to be applied. And we believe that he should not go to prison. He's too young. He has too much good in front of him. He's never committed any violent crime. The Georgia State Penitentiary is only going to hurt him. It's not going to help him. And the judge was very kind to adjust my sentence, but she said, Unfortunately, because of the crimes he's committed, I, I have to send him to prison. He's going to prison. But I'm going to reduce his sentence to one year, and I'm going to increase the num number of years of parole. So I ended up doing a year in prison and eight years of parole. And I went to, because I was only getting one year, they sentenced me to what's called a work camp. It's actually ran like military style. Yeah. So there's like a sergeant that like comes in and you have to stand out of tension. You have to march everywhere you go. Oh, wow. But it is prison. It was primarily gang members, and it was violence almost every day. Uh, uh, it was not a good place to turn your life around in any way. But it was significantly safer and significantly better than the Georgia State prisons, where there's literally no law, order, nothing. It's just chaos. Uh, there, if you misbehaved enough, they would tell you, they would send you to the state prison. So there was like this stick hanging over everybody's head, like we're going to behave enough to not get sent to the Georgia State Prison. Um, but for the most part, I mean, it, it was really rough. There was no college courses. There was no classes. There was GED and church, and that was it. And I passed the GED like immediately, like the first month I was there. So I was basically sitting in a cell, you know, for a year, and I got out one hour a week for church, basically. Okay. Harley, I, I know there's many people in the world, including John and me, who have had moments where we've felt stuck. But it, it's, I mean, it's comparing it to your experience where it's not like a day or a week or even a month of feeling stuck. You know, you're talking years of your life here uh, with a number of circumstances that led up to all of these events. And you know, you, you sort of find yourself while serving time, um, you got your GED, which is, which was great. And then also finding faith in something, um, which I imagine is also continued to play a, a role in your life and your decisions going forward. So walk us through sort of the, the end of that experience and then what that started to lead to for you. Yeah. So when I was incarcerated, in in Chatham, in jail in Florida, jail in Chatham County, which is like Savannah, Georgia, and then prison about an hour north of of Savannah towards Atlanta. All of these times, I had no visitors. I my mom didn't see me. My brother didn't see me. My brother didn't write me. My brother didn't call me. My mom didn't call me or write me. 
And I just really, you know, what do you do? You know, I'm in the scariest situation that I could ever imagine and completely alone. And, um, you know, you're, you're, you're taught not to build like, um, vulnerable connections with people in prison. It's dangerous. Like you literally should not trust these people around you because you don't know some of them are great people, yep. but you can't risk. You have to just assume that you can't. So I'm kind of like in, in a shell and I have a Bible and, you know, I didn't grow up going to church, but I, I read the Bible in prison and after, you know, a, a while around all these guys, you start to see there are some people who read the Bible regularly. They go to church that you can just tell they the chances are low that they aren't good people. So I ended up connecting with a couple guys in jail and prison that really just told me like, look, you're in a really, really bad situation, but that God has a plan for you. And that if you invest in this and read this and, and, and live by it, like you're gonna be okay. Like you you really are like, this is all you need in this moment is, is this book. And you know, there's other people in here who believe in this as well. And none of us are, none of these people are going to hurt you. And, Jeez. um, you know, I'm not, I'm still not super religious. You know, I, I, I've had ups and downs and flows where I went years without going to church or reading the Bible. Um, but it definitely played a role in me getting through it because, um, it did on nights when I was like, felt the most alone and the most scared, it brought me comfort. And I do believe that, um, there's benefit to the soul, like your soul benefits when you know you're not alone. So, uh, if nothing else, that's what I took from it. And, you know, I go to church now and I, and I love being a part of it, but, um, I was so alone in that, that, uh, book helped me not feel so alone. And, uh, there was, uh, times where, uh, I would have done anything to get out and I couldn't. So what do you do? You know? You, you you uh find ways to adapt and to get through it and 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 that's what I did um it's interesting to be discussing loneliness in this part of your life um because there's what's not talked about often enough in my opinion is the loneliness that comes with being an entrepreneur and it's amazing some of the lessons you learned, however you learn them. Um, and then the things that you find to help support you through that process um, to get you to where you want to go. And, and, you know, the silver lining of all of it is you, you found faith. You ha learned how to deal with loneliness, which is probably in some strange way helped you um, become successful in, in what you're doing now. And I don't want to leave out the important part that after you you got out of um, of prison, you went on to the Ohio State University with honors. So congratulations on that. Um, yeah. But all of your hard work and change of perspective uh, in the effort to find faith and, and find yourself really was still met with resistance due to your past. So. Just share a little bit about some of your early experiences trying to enter the workforce and then how it started to lead into your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, so so while I was incarcerated, I read a ton. I mean, that was one of the things is I was trying to stay out of the trouble. So I kind of tried to say to myself, I read a ton of books, 50, 60 books, which for me was a lot because I hated reading as a kid. And <laughs> I still pretty confident I'm like dyslexic. I read a ton of books, but I have to read them very slowly. And yeah. sometimes I have to reread everything twice just to understand it. But I knew when I was incarcerated, uh, so like I said, no one really visited me or wrote me or anything. But towards the end of my sentence, my aunt and my grandma who came to my father's wedding did start writing me. And I really started to build a relationship with them and realize like all of them have education. All of them have stable lives. They have each other they all love each other very much and they're they're like a happy family and they i started to realize they have like all the things that i wish i had and when writing them they were like we're so glad to hear that you're reading and that you got your ged and you know i told them i, I want to go to school if i can when i get out so uh they offered to pick me up on my last day of prison and my aunt came, drove down from columbus ohio and picked me up and when i came home i was just excited to be free 
not going to commit any crimes. I knew all that, but I didn't know how hard the road would be. I really had no idea. And I was very lucky uh, that when I came home, I had uh, a bed to sleep in. They let me stay in their basement. They had like a finished basement. So I stayed in this kind of nice basement. Um, and I, they gave me a bicycle. So immediately I had kind of the bare necessities I needed to, to sleep and to get places. But um, yeah, I ended up washing dishes at a Japanese steakhouse for a year super low pay like seven dollars an hour but they let me work overtime and i did i worked as much as i possibly could because my aunt had this like laminated list of rules for her house for me and it was like you have to be home by eight you're not allowed to have a phone or you're not allowed to um yeah i think she said you're not allowed to have a phone you're not allowed to spend your own money if you make money you have to give it to us until you move out uh there's just all these rules i had to do at one chore every day blah, blah blah so it was like two months. I had bought a car off Craigslist for $1,000 and I got my own apartment because the anxiety of having them parent me, like to basically be like, look, you haven't had any rules for four or yeah. five years, but now here's a bunch of them and you got to follow them <laughs> or else you're not welcome to stay in our house. Yeah. And I, I was like, I know they love me, but the anxiety it caused me was crazy. So I just worked as hard as I could and I got out and I had my own apartment, my own car, and I was washing dishes and I became a line cook Line cook doesn't pay well either, so I was working 60-hour weeks to to make money, but I was able to save money. I was working all I could, and I was saving. And a, a, a busboy said, I, you know, I got into college. I'm super excited to go to college. This, like, kid that was a high school student at the restaurant. And I was like, man, I would love to go to school. And he's like, why don't you? And I'm like, I can't. I got, like, a prison GED. No college is going to let me in. And he's like, yeah, they will go to the community college. So I, so I applied to community college, and sure enough, I got in, and to my surprise, I, I excelled. I got almost straight A's for three semesters straight. And on a whim, one weekend, I just applied to the Ohio State University. I didn't tell anybody. I just applied. And I remember one day, I just got a letter in the mail that said, congratulations, you've you've got in. And I called my family and told them, and they could not believe it. They were like, what? No, what? How? That's awesome. And I'm like, I applied. And, uh, you know, I remember even even my family that loved me, like the my aunts and, and their husbands and my grandma, they were all like, okay, okay. Well, Har- Harley's going to try to try to go to Ohio State. <laughs> and I just remember thinking like, okay, I'm going to have to try and make it through this. It's going to be really hard. And even one of my bosses at the restaurant had gone to the business school at Ohio State. And he was telling me, he's like, oh man, it, it's really hard. Like, it's really hard to to get through the, that program. And I was like, okay. But I, I uh, took out student loans. You know, I had to cut back my work hours. I, uh, I did go like 50 grand into student loan, uh, student loan debt, 60 grand. I still pay it today. But changed my life i mean being able to surround yourself um with a fresh start i didn't have any of the bad influences in columbus ohio i had family and this was a critical point for me is knowing that i had someone to let down yeah you had community you had purpose you had all those things that you were lacking or missing now started to come together for you and i had some value in myself for the first time i was like i am doing something i do have a perp like something i'm building towards so you know, I, I went on to graduate with honors, top of my class. I got a Six Sigma certification while I was in college. I nice. was the treasurer of a student organization so that I could put that on my resume. And um, unfortunately, like my senior year, I interviewed with like 80 companies like Boeing, Rolls Royce, EY, you know, all the all the companies that were from these schools. And I'd get to like third round interviews and I would tell them that when you run the background check, you're going to see this. I want to tell you my story and blah, blah, blah. And then they would just email me a day or two later and say they're sorry they couldn't hire me. So, um, man, Har- Harley, I want to just step back and 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 you know you, when you talk about you, people that you're letting know that you're going to Ohio State University and they're saying oh it's going to be hard they don't understand like you do what you've already been <laughs> through. So. So I think you've already predetermined in your mind that this is going to be a success. That you're going to succeed. You're going to make it. Because look at all the other things you've overcome to get to this place. And now, yeah, you graduate from Ohio State with honors. Yep. You're you're faced with, you know, getting a job and nobody's hiring you. So you go out and you're helping now to lead the fair chance movement through your venture backed company. Honest jobs, as well as working with various organizations to raise awareness and support for the huge community of justice impacted individuals, just like just like you were. 
Um, so share more about this part of your life journey and some of the major milestones that you've achieved so far after starting. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it started with this experience of struggling to find a job, even when I was like the most qualified, right? Um, my, my peers that were, you know, getting hammered at frat houses and getting C's in every class were getting hired with the same companies I was getting denied for. So like, <laughs> you know, you're absolutely right. Is it, it was a skill for me. I knew I was going to make it through it because I, I knew the opportunity in front of me was so much greater than anything I had. Yeah. And so many people in life, they have opportunities, so they don't understand the opportunity they have, right? They don't understand that they, every day they wake up, is like an opportunity to do something great. Uh, but me, I knew that like I had seen everything else. This was my chance. So, you know, when I was interviewing and being rejected and rejected and rejected, it just hit me. And I, I started doing research and trying to understand like, how is it this hard for me? I'm a white male, college educated. I have a car. I have a house. I have an 800 credit score. I have letters of recommendation. I have like, how can I not convince one person to just give me a job? And I started researching it and I start saying, okay, well, there's actually 20 million Americans with felonies another 40 to 50 with misdemeanors, but it's this massive population. Yeah. And, and the people with felonies are primarily poor people. That's the most common denominator is poverty, right? If you're in poverty, you're more likely to go to prison. But then there's also layers of of uh, race that affect it as well. Yeah. But I just saw this massive opportunity. I'm like, how the research shows that over 60% of people are still unemployed a year after being incarcerated. So how is this this massive amount of value sitting on the sideline in our economy. And, and that's really what inspired me to do this. So I did eventually find a job. I worked at Owens Corning, a manufacturing plant. I was a supervisor. But okay. while I was there, I wrote this book called How to Get a Job and Build a Career with a Criminal Record. Oh, nice. That that book has sold over 7,000 copies. I mean, oh, I, wow. I don't know. I've probably made like 40 grand, 50 grand off the book over <laughs> the last awesome. you know, eight years. And that got me speaking engagements. And I started volunteering at prisons. And that really is where I was like, I have to lean into this and find a way to work in this space. And for me, it was all for-profit entrepreneurship. I have to find a way to create like a social enterprise where I can address this problem, but I don't want to be a fundraiser. I don't want to beg people for free money. And ultimately, I, I created a community just like your membership at a YouTube channel. And I had about 30 people paying seven bucks a month. And I surveyed those 30 people and I said, hey, how can I best help you? And everyone yep. needed help finding a job. So... I created like six little micro courses where I was teaching them how to write a resume, how to interview, how to explain your criminal record. And ultimately I knew that that wasn't going to scale to help 50 million people. I needed to create something that was more marketable, uh, more sustainable, especially if I was going to look for venture capital. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I got really lucky and I'll, I'll try and be brief here, but I was at a bar drinking a beer and the guy next to me and I started talking and this is why God's probably real. It's because this story <laughs> is uh, the ra the guy next to me, we just started talking. He said, what do you do? And I said, well, I work at a manufacturing plant, but I'm, I'm about to quit and start this startup. This is what I do. And he was like, oh, well, I'm an angel investor. Here's my business card. I'd love to get out of here. I no swear to God. Way. So anyways, we talked two or three times over Zoom in the next month, month and a half. And he ended up saying, well, are, if you're fundraising, I'd like to invest. And I said, I don't even know how to fundraise. I, what do you mean? And he said, fill out this... <laughs> Roll out this document and send it back to me. And I filled out a Y Combinator safe. And this dude awesome. wired me $100,000 for 6% of my company. And I only that had like a website. I was like trying wow. to figure it out. I knew nothing. And it turns out that his son had been arrested for a bunch of prescription pills. But because he had the money, no he was a way. hedge fund manager in Boston. His son didn't do any time. No conviction, nothing. And he said, it's unfair in this country that my son is free, doing well, didn't have to go through nothing you went through just because I have money and you had to deal with all of that just because you're poor. So he gave me a hundred grand and he's my, yeah, he came to my wedding a couple months ago. He's a good friend and changed my life. Uh, but from there, it took me about a year to kind of learn by building. We were just building and learning and building and learning. And we, yep. I applied and got into tech stars and learned some more. And during tech stars, I met some mentors who gave me another $1.1 $1 million dollars. And then about six months after that, I raised another $1.7 million. So we've raised about $3 million total. Um, we've made about $2 million wow. in revenue, all from companies who hire justice and back to people through us. So we have a national network of 1,500 companies that use us to hire this population. And we have five and a half million monthly searches from That's justice impacted people using our app. And uh, 
it's still it's it's been hard. We've been doing this for so long. It's almost been five years, but it's really just the beginning. We're we're hitting like exponential growth. It seems like every month it's faster and faster, and um, we get we get so many positive reviews from our users saying that we help them find jobs. You know, so quickly. Uh, and at the essence of what we've created is an algorithm that if you tell us what your crime is and you give us your resume, we can read all the job descriptions in your area and promote the jobs to you that you have the best chance of getting hired for. Um, so we're using like natural language processing to interpret the nature of the crime and the nature of the job duties and try and match. And uh, we're helping people find jobs in uh, about seven to eight times faster. That's, I mean, if anyone had any doubts yeah. that there was a higher power out there, whatever that is. I mean, your story is living proof that there's something bigger than us in the universe. And it's amazing what you've been able to do in, in a rather short time uh, for this community of people, Harley. And I know that employment and education are two of the biggest factors that impact the recidivism rate of people who have been justice impacted. So congratulations on all the success up to this point, and I know it's going to continue. Um, what we like to do uh, before we sign off is just for, if you want to leave our audience with one or two pieces of advice, and we'll leave all of your um, contact information and website information in our show notes. If you want to leave them with uh, a couple of things to take away, practical advice for them to think about if they're starting something new, contemplating starting something new, or you know are going through something tough. What would that be? Yeah, I think um, you hear you, you probably hear this a lot, but get started. You know, the get over the fear of rejection or the fear of failure because that's that's just the name of the game. The more more reps you get in, the easier it becomes. And just get started building today. Like find a community. That's another one. Is it is lonely? It's extremely hard to build a company, and if you're alone trying to do it, it is much much harder. Uh, so I have a network of guys that pretty much were like therapists for each other. We have about four, I have about four other founders that we talk to on a regular basis and we basically just vent about how hard our lives are <laughs> and like how much we want to give up and how it's affecting our, our relationships with our wives or our yeah. girlfriends and all the challenges yeah. that come that aren't even the building the business challenge. Building the business yeah. is, is one challenge. Then there's a personal story. What I would say is, uh, get started though. The best way to learn is to do start building something yep. uh, and know that the first thing you build isn't what is likely going to be the end product, right? So don't judge yourself based on the first version of your business. Uh, it's all about just getting in and yep. getting familiar with the people and the terminology and the, the field that you're playing on. So connect with people. You guys have the membership community. I mean, if people are listening to this and this is the third or fourth episode, I would advise joining your community, but there's other communities online as well that can be good for founders. And and I used to go to every single meetup and event bright that was business related I could go to nice. uh, when I had time to go because I just wanted to connect with other other like-minded people. That's a huge one. Harley, uh, your story, uh, I, I actually can't wait for this to come out because I want to listen to it again. And just, it, it's so inspiring. And your yeah. your attitude and your positivity, um, there the whole time we were talking, there, there really wasn't any blame placed on anybody. It's just the situation that you were in and the circum set of circumstances that you found yourself in and you've navigated yourself out of it. And you've been so successful in navigating yourself out of it. You're now helping others. So man, that that is truly commendable. And I really appreciate your time being on the show with us today. It's incredibly inspired. So thank you very much. Absolutely, John. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much, Harley. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Michael. This is awesome. And with that said, we are going to sign off and we look forward to talking to everyone again next week. We'll see you. The second act with Michael and John stars Michael Newborn and John Ballinger. The podcast is produced by Seltzer Kings. For more information on the show, check out michaelandjohn.com. Or if you'd like to get involved in the conversation, give the guys a shout on their socials at the second act with Michael and John on most platforms. Thanks for listening. Oh, yeah.